going to, oh, it's working. That's it.
Good morning, Broadus family. Good to see everybody. Whether you're, uh, whether you're here in the sanctuary or whether you're in the parking lot, whether you're on Facebook, you're part of our Broadus family. We're so glad to have you. Um, a few announcements. Uh, let's see, first, uh, Mike Bohannon, you want to speak to the firewood ministry? Good morning. Uh, if you don't know, we do a firewood ministry here. We cut, split wood, and give it to those in need that need that uh, wood to heat with. We are very, very low, pretty much almost out of our supply that we have, and we still have requests coming in. But we do have a tree company that has donated us about three dump truck loads of logs of good hardwood material. Um, and we need to get that cut, split, and stacked in the shed that the uh, Wednesday crew got built um, and get that ready for whoever needs that wood as soon as we can. So this coming Saturday on the 12th, we are going to do a uh, cut and split and stack day. We're gonna, our hours are going to be like 8.30 to 3, but whatever time you can give, we're going to be here as long as we can and get as much done as we can and get ready to go. And we will also provide lunch. So if you can come out and help, if you have chainsaws, splitters, axe, any of that, bring it with you. If you don't, still come and help. Men, women, and children can help do this. There's work for everybody to do. And there's a sign-up sheet on the right-hand side when you walk out on a bright orange poster. If you can sign up with how many people are coming and if you're going to be here for lunch or not so that Lynn can have a head count for how many people to feed. And if you have any other questions about it, feel free to grab me and let me know. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Cutting firewood will warm you. So if it's a cold day, just come on out. You'll be warmed up shortly. Um, for now, we will be having a fun Friday for the kids. Um, please sign up with Miss Karen by Thursday, or uh, we'll see. The uh, menu for this Wednesday night dinner is hot dogs, baked beans, coleslaw, dessert, if you haven't made a reservation, you can make one this morning or call the church office uh, by noon on Monday. Same goes if you need to cancel. Call the church office by noon on Monday. Um, Susan, I don't see Susan Smith. Um, <clears throat> Moments of Hope meal um, is going to be fixed on Saturday, March 5th. If you'd like to help prepare that, see Susan Smith or give her a call. Um, I think she's recruiting people. Now, um, let's see, anything else? I think Jamie wanted to have a little, I have a few words. Good morning. Broadus Worship Jam is going to be Saturday, February 26th from 10 until 3. Lunch is going to be provided. We want to encourage you to come out. Um, if you have an instrument, bring your instrument. Um, last week I made a joke about kazoos. Sorry for anyone that was offended. Bring your kazoo. Um, no, we're really just trying to gauge interest and get people excited. There's, there's going to be a, a list of songs that we're going to put out. Um, and we're, we're choosing all the best ones with G, C, and D so everybody can, <laughs> can come and have, and have fun. But if you're interested in singing or playing or you want to learn more um, about sound, we would love to have you come out. I'm just going to play lunch by ear. I'm going to see who's here around lunchtime and probably pick up some pizzas. But I really hope you can come. Thank you. And you don't have to stay the entire time. It's, it's a come and go, almost like an open house kind of thing. All right, if you join me in prayer. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us. And Father, we just, uh, we're here to worship you, Lord. And we give you our all in this worship. In thy name we pray, amen. Would you please stand? We have a song for you this morning um, that was actually uh, one of Jasmine's favorites, and we're excited to do this morning. Hopefully you've, you've heard it, but if not, it's really easy to pick up. It's called Glorious Day. 
All right, I want to invite the children up here, and we're going to be on this side, so I'm going to need you over in this, this section to today, because I need you guys to help me with kind of a, a, a matching game, okay? Yeah, I can just come right, you like matching games, well good, perfect, this is, this is just perfect for you. Anybody else, we got it set? Okay, well, when, well, since there are four of you, and, and y'all see I got some fruit up here. Do y'all know what kind of fruit these are? You know what that is? Apple. That's an apple, okay. Hmm, what would this be? A uh, banana. Now, do you know what? This is a little strange. you know what this is? Oh, nice try. He said kiwi, not a kiwi. These are figs. 
And I, I know that you know, we, don't, we don't necessarily see a lot of figs or eat a lot of figs, but the Bible talks a lot about figs. So. And then these are grapes. grapes. Okay, now, so four different fruit, and they all grow a little bit different, okay? They, they don't all grow on the same kind of tree or, or anything. So I'm going to give, since I happen to have four of you, I'm going to give each of you a picture, and I want you to try to decide if you can, if you can tell which fruit grows on which kind of bush or tree or something like that. And I'm sorry for y'all guys out there, you can't see these pictures very well, but trust me, all right, it's good, all right. All right, so who thinks they know what kind of fruit grows on their tree? All right, Joe, come on, come on up here. What do you think, which one are you going to choose? Oh, nice try, but try again. Let's just say it's not the grapes. You want to hold on and see where other people put theirs? All right, you just hold, hold on. Who thinks they know? I know. All right, all right, all right y'all come on, come on up here. Right, you can just come on up. Up. Nope, nope, that's not it. That's not it. Where do you think? Oop, oop. Watch the kneeling bench. Nope, not the apple. Who has the apple tree? Apple. Oh, there we go. So I'm going to stick it. I've got some tape up there, so I'm just going to stick. So there's an, an apple tree. Yeah, you see those big leaves? So that's the banana, and that is the fig bush. They sometimes call it a fig tree. And then over here, all right, so, so these are different. So an apple tree, you know, if I showed you like an apple tree and maybe a plum tree um, with no fruit on it, it might be kind of hard to tell the difference if you didn't know them very well. And this one, the picture really helped because there's actually apples on that tree. Okay, so, so that helped. And then bananas, they're, they're kind of more tropical. And see those big leaves? And so that's kind of how you can uh, identify kind of the banana tree. And, and it's, it's, it's different than the apple tree, all right? And then figs kind of grow on a bush, but they can, get, they can get big. But once again, they're not like an apple tree. And then what do grapes grow on? Vines. Okay, so it might be kind of hard to see, but... But there's kind of some, some big, thick vines that are coming up from the ground. And then usually there's some sort of what we may call a trellis or something or even some wire that the vines run along there. And if you looked at that picture really closely, there are actually some green grapes hanging at the, you know, at the, at the bottom. So today and in the coming couple of weeks, I'm going to be talking about one of Jesus' stories about grape vines. Okay, and, and, and grapes, so you can listen for that. Uh, you can listen for that today. But what these different kinds of fruit remind me of is that just like the fruit, God makes people different, right? We're not all the same. We don't look the same. We don't, we don't act the same. We don't have the same interests and all. But one thing that God expects us to be, and the, the Bible tells us this, is fruitful. Now, we don't grow fruit on us, do we? No, no I, hope, I hope not. That would be very strange. But when the Bible says we're supposed to be fruitful, it means we're supposed to do good things and help people and tell people about Jesus and, and just you make the world a better place. And, and, and so uh, he wants us to be fruitful. And so Jesus told a story, and we're going to be talking about grapes to, uh, in the sermon, but Jesus told a story about a man who planted a fig tree and year after year, he watched it, and it never had figs on it. So he thought, this tree is just wasting space. It's, you know, it's sucking nutrients from the ground, but it's, it's not giving any fruit. So he told his gardener, just go ahead and cut it down or dig it up, get rid of it. And the gardener said, no, give me one more year. He says, I'm going to fertilize it and take care of it and see if next year maybe it will grow some fruit. So he didn't want to give up on it. He wanted to try real hard to help that bush grow some, some fruit. And so God works like that in us. He doesn't give up on us. He keeps wanting to, to teach us how to do good things, how to, how to help people, how to tell people about Jesus. And so I'm very thankful that God doesn't give, give up on us, but he keeps working on us to help us to do, uh, to do better. And so what I want you to be thinking about this week is, 
you know, what kind of good fruit can I bear? Meaning, what kind of good things can I do? What nice thing can I say that's going to maybe encourage someone? Or, um, you know, who can I, maybe I know someone going through a hard time and, and maybe I can pray for them. Well, that touches their heart. And God says, that's good fruit. So we all need to be thinking about what, what good fruit that we can uh, have in our lives that will glorify God. So, I'm going to say a prayer, but then don't run away because I actually have some fruit to give you. And they are grapes because those are nice and easy. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you've given each of us a chance to do good things and to help people. And you teach us how to do that. And we have the example of Jesus. And, and when Jesus works in our hearts, we know the right things to do. So just like a, a fruit tree bears fruit, I pray that you would help us to do good things that glorify you and to do that each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, come over here real quick. There you go. Thanks. You can go back with your families. I'll be reading from uh, Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 1, uh, verses 9 through 14. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, uh, so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. I'd like to invite you to stand one more time with us this, this morning.
You may be seated. Through the years, I've told Ellis, you know, I need somebody, I, I need you to play me a little bit of It's a Wonderful Day in the Neighborhood, or the, the theme song from Cheers, or in this case, I heard it through the grapevine, because that's going to be our theme for a, uh, a couple of weeks here. Uh, we're, we're entering this, this new worship series, I call it Lessons of the Vine, and so really for four Sundays, we're going to be exploring parts of uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 15, which is an incredible chapter with so many deep truths. And, and the primary metaphor that Jesus uses, or we might just call it an illustration, uh, it comes kind of early in the, the chapter of John 15, and it's that of the vineyard and the vine that grows then, the precious fruit, which of course is the grape. And I just want to give my acknowledgement, my thanks to uh, uh, the old Scottish pastor and writer, William Barclay, and then uh, Bruce Wilkinson, who wrote The Secrets of the Vine, because some of that material really helped me uh, shape these messages. When, when Jesus drew the mental picture of a vine, he knew what he was talking about. Every Jew, every inhabitant of that uh, Near Eastern world knew how grapes grew. Vineyards were, were everywhere. Now, rich landowners could have huge vineyards, and they grew it for the, for the profit. They made money selling the grapes or the raisins and, of course, the wine. But even families, even poor families, often had uh, their own grape arbor just for their family consumption. And as Jesus often did when telling parables or illustrating spiritual truths, he drew upon the most common elements of life, things that people could understand. And so the grapevine was familiar for another reason as well. Over and over in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel is pictured as a vine or as God's vineyard. From, from the prophet Isaiah, it says, "...the vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel." In Jeremiah uh, the Lord says, I planted you like a choice vine of sound and reliable stock. In the Psalms, it says, you brought a vine out of Egypt and planted it. All right, so talking about the children of Israel leaving Egypt and settling in the promised land. Even the prophet Hosea said, Israel was a spreading vine. So every Jew Raised in synagogue worship, they knew this image. And, and the vine then became uh, symbolic of the nation of Israel. There were pictures of, of grapes and of grape vines on their coins. And there was even a, a vine formed out of gold that adorned the front of the holy place of the temple. And it said that rich citizens would sometimes bring gold as a gift to be molded into a bunch of grapes or into a new branch of the vine, and it would be added then to that, to that artwork. It was an honor, and it was much admired. But the people knew something else about the Old Testament image of the grapevine. Every time the vine represented the people of Israel, the greater context of the passage revealed that the vine was not what it should have been. It had grown wild, meaning it had been planted good, but then had not been cared for and, and was not bearing fruit as it should. Or the grapes on the vine had become bitter. Or the vineyard was just plain barren. You see, Israel had not fulfilled the role that God had chosen for them. So, on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane, on the night of his arrest, 
just after Jesus ate the Last Supper, what we call the Last Supper, with his disciples in the upper room, Jesus continued teaching his disciples uh, on this journey to Gethsemane. And he's telling them what it is to be a child of God, what it really means to be a true disciple. And so he told them in this, which is really among his very last teachings before his crucifixion, that he is the true vine. And God's true people were those who stayed connected to him. So the true vine is not the nation of Israel. It's not people who attend a certain church or a certain denomination. The true vine is or it's not those who were born into a certain family, but rather those who follow Christ. So picture Jesus at night taking that journey from the upper room to Gethsemane by the light of the moon, maybe by the lanterns that the disciples were carrying and they stop along this winding path. Now, perhaps that there is a, a, a cultivated terrace there with some grape trellises. Now, there would be the stubs of those vines, which would have been pruned back, you know, in the, in the fall. And at this time of year, would just be putting out the, the new leaves and the, the new vines would be growing from, or the new branches would be growing from the, from the vine on what would be an age-old trunk. In fact, some of the, the, the grape, the roots and the, the trunk of the grapevine uh, could be a hundred years old or more. So Jesus stopped there, and he used that as a teachable moment. I see him kind of beckoning the disciples over uh, to, the, uh, to the orchard, to the vineyard, and showing them what was happening. And so remember now, Judas has already slipped away in order to betray Jesus. But to the other 11 disciples, this is what Jesus uh, says to them and teaches them. So I'm going to read here from John chapter 15, the first eight verses. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. And if a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples." I imagine after this teaching, the disciples would never look at a, at a grapevine the same way again. Jesus sees three very powerful images and uses them in his illustration. The first thing he says is that he himself, Jesus, is the vine. Now, I'm just going to tell you, for a long time I was confused about this teaching because I didn't know much about how grapes grew or grape vines. But I knew trees, and I knew kudzu, and I knew English ivy, and vines like that. So I always said, no, the vines grow in the branches. The branches are the big things holding up the vines. Well, we're talking about a different creature when we're talking about a grapevine. The vine is the thick part. The branches are the little, starting off almost looking like tendrils, but the, the little shoots that grow off it. And those branches can grow in a, in a season 20 feet or more long, and the fruit then comes from those, uh, those branches. Now, most often then, the, the vine is trimmed back to, to maybe just a few feet off the ground during the, the winter, but then the new growth, the leaves, and the, the new uh, uh, branches 
come in the spring. So Jesus said, I, I am that vine, that source of nutrition, that source of growth for any who would then be uh, united with me. And then he says, God is the gardener. So, uh, you know, there, there is an allegorical part to this illustration. And so God is the vine dresser or the uh, keeper of the vineyard. His task is to coax the best quality and quantity of produce from the vineyard. He has the knowledge for watering and fertilizing and most importantly, the wisdom for how to prune the branches so that they produce the best fruit. And so then God does that kind of thing for us. And we're going to be talking about that more in the weeks to come. But then the third image is the branches. We are the branches. Or as Jesus was speaking, he says, you are the branches off the vine. That slender new growth that may twist and, and, and wind um, you, you know, across the trellis. And this is what produces the fruit. And I know that some of you are crafty people. You know, you, you're, you're always making clever things. And some people will take grape vines and make wreaths out of them. In fact, I think we may have some at the, at the front of the church. And, uh, but just understand that the true purpose of a grape vine is not ornamental. It is there to actually produce a harvest. And so I don't know if you noticed as I read the passage how often Jesus mentioned the fruit and fruitfulness. This was important to him. He knew that he would not be on earth in physical form very much longer. By God's plan, the growth of the kingdom of God would come through people with a heart connection to his son, Jesus Christ. They would be called not just the children of God, they would be called the body of Christ. And they would be the branches of the vine. Their purpose was to produce good fruit for the kingdom, to make a difference, to make this world a better place, to lead people to faith. And it would be done by the power of Christ flowing through them, like sap flowing through a trunk and into the branches. Now, it's important for us to understand what kind of fruit Jesus is looking for. But first, let me tell you what it's not. Of course, it's not that. It's not the fruit we buy in the grocery store. But it's also not your bank account or how much money is in it. It's not how big your family is or how many children you have produced. The fruit that God is looking for is not how many people you know or even how many people know you. The fruit that God wants is not the number of diplomas that might hang on your wall or the number of suits in your uh, closet or the, the cars in your garage. Do you know why those things fail to meet the criteria of being fruit in the lives of Christians? It's because they have no lasting value. That same chapter, John 15, in verse 16, Jesus said, I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, okay? So there's the definition of what Jesus is looking for, something eternal. And Jesus spoke to this also in the Sermon on the Mount, this familiar passage from Matthew chapter 6, when he said, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So the, the key to fruitfulness as a disciple of Jesus is not how much money you have, but how you invest it in things that really matter. For how you take care of the needs of people, including your own family, about how you help those are, who are less fortunate, how you use that money to spread the gospel 
of Jesus Christ around the world, that's where the eternal value is. It's not how many kids that you sire, but whether you have instilled in them the love of the Lord. It's not how many acquaintances you have, but how many people you've had a positive impact on by giving of yourself, by loving them. It's not what you've learned in school, but how you've used that wisdom to do good, to bring glory to God. God is looking for things of eternal value. And so in the Bible, we find that the term fruit and the term, you know, the uh, good works are often used interchangeably. We, we read in, in uh, John 15, 16, he says, I appointed you to go and bear fruit. Well, I think now we know what he's talking about. But the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 2.10, he says, We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. That's God's purpose for us here on earth. And he also said to Titus, he said, Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order that they may provide for daily necessities and not live unproductive or unfruitful lives. So what does eternal spiritual fruit look like? Well, I kind of, I guess just for me, I, I, I divide this up into three different groups. One is what I call inner fruit. Things that people can't really see because it's, it's in our hearts. And, and the Apostle Paul writes about the fruit of the Spirit that grows within believers. Galatians 5.22 says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I don't even think that list is meant to be exhaustive. It's just to start getting us thinking about the character of Jesus. And so in that verse, he kind of gives us a metric by which we can measure the character of Christ growing in us. And so I say this, this inner fruit comprises who we are, what kind of people we are. And it's supposed to constantly grow. We are supposed to be more like Jesus each and every day in our attitudes, in our faith. And we should have all aspects of that fruit. Uh, in, in the Greek, the, the word fruit is actually, it's not fruits, it's fruit. It's singular, which to me says it's not something you can divide up and say, oh, no, I'm a good, I'm a good Christian because I'm, I'm gentle, okay? Um, well, that's part of it. But it all goes together to have that love and that joy and that peace and, and, and then that, that patience and gentleness with, with people. It, it's all the character of Christ that grows within us. Uh, within us. And so that's what I call the inner fruit. Then there's the outer fruit. And this is, in essence, the good works. Things that people can see. Not so much who you are, but what you do. It's evident to other people. Your outer fruit is bringing glory to God through what you do and say. And so you have children or grandchildren. If you take time to read Bible stories with them and discuss what it means in our lives, that, that's fruitful. That has eternal value. When you go to visit a sick friend, when you pause to pray with a coworker who's going through a, a tough time, when you feed a hungry person in Jesus' name, when you give to support missionaries, when you're involved in Inasmuch Day or the Moments of Hope Ministry, when you work on a Habitat for Humanity house, when you prepare a Sunday school lesson, which can then be shared with your class, when you forgive somebody who has done you wrong, these are the outer fruit. These are things that make a difference and something that you are able to do for others. Now, I, I'm going to tell you that much of your outer fruit, the things that you do, um, may naturally be determined by your spiritual gifts. And we've had sermons and studies on, on finding your spiritual gift, 
Has God gifted you to be a teacher or a preacher? Some people have the gift of giving. Some have the gift of mercy or, or helping or, or witnessing. And we talk about spiritual gifts being the things that God made you kind of interested in and good at. But what I want to say to you is never limit what God may ask you to do. He will often work within the scope of, this, of your spiritual gift or what you understand to be your spiritual gift. But then he also often stretches us outside of our comfort zone. So when God leads you to do something, never hide behind the excuse of, well, that's, that's not my spiritual gift. Well, first of all, you may not know what your spiritual gifts are. God gets to decide that. He gives them, and then he asks you what he wants you to do. So I see the inner and outer fruit, and then I'm going to add to this evangelism. One of the spiritual gifts is evangelism, leading people to Christ, introducing them to your Savior, telling them what he has done for you. And, and when we do that, we are not responsible for another person's uh, response, we're just responsible to share. But every follower of Jesus, whether or not they think they have the spiritual gift of evangelism, we are all responsible for being witnesses. We can do it in different ways. We need to follow the leadership of the Spirit in, in our lives. But I'm just going to tell you that when a person repents of their sins, they find eternal life through Christ that is really the highest form of, of spiritual, eternal fruit. And how wonderful, folks, it'll be to stand in heaven as a forgiven sinner before, uh, before God and for there to be someone there that you have helped lead to Christ. Oh, that will be the greatest joy. So all of these things have eternal value because they glorify God. And they are the only things of this world that you can take with you to heaven. They don't earn your way into heaven, but they are, uh, they are evidence that Christ has changed your life. And so in John 15, Jesus also describes a, a progression uh, of the fruitfulness of the branches of the vine. And he talks about some branches that bear no fruit. And so if you picture here a basket, you know, if you were harvesting grapes and you're putting them in the basket, the image here is the empty basket. There is no fruit. People like this, the world is no better off because of them. The grace of God is not manifest in their living and the glory of God is not exalted in the world through them. Now, none of us can truly know a person's heart, but objectively, it would be difficult to identify such a person as a believer and a follower of Jesus because they have nothing to show for it. But then he also, and this is, you just have to kind of read carefully into verse 2, there are branches that bear fruit. They bear some fruit. So you might picture a basket that's partially filled. And, and to me, this is, you know, sometimes a young Christian or someone who has not been a Christian in a very long time, but then even more often maybe an immature Christian. Not doesn't matter how long, they, how long ago they walked the aisle or put their faith in Christ, but they've never really matured. And so here is a person whose fruitfulness for Christ is not growing from year to year. There's never any real change. They're not letting... Uh, Christ make a difference in their behavior and their in their faith. They're probably not involved in a regular ongoing ministry program. They're probably not regularly praying, both for themselves and their families and others. And they're probably not really delving into the Word of God very much. But they have some faith, and so they show some fruit. But then it talks about bearing more fruit. So this is the image of, of an increase, a growing Christian. This person has learned to step out in faith to, new, to do new things for God. To do something this year 
that they, they didn't do last year. And it probably, or they, they are probably involved in Bible study and in worship uh, and in some area of ministry to others. But then if you go all the way down to verse 8, there are those who bear much fruit. And here's what verse 8 said about it. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. The image I see here is the overflowing basket. These are people sold out for Jesus. They're offering their lives to him as living sacrifices. Other people look at them and they can tell there's a difference. There, there's something about this person that's, that's different than the others around me or different than me. And the glory from that goes not to the person, it goes to God. Their spiritual gift may not be evangelism, but what they do and what they say still tends to draw people to Christ. Are they perfect people? No, they're not perfect, but they are continually making a difference for God. So the question is, in that progression of the branch that bears no fruit, the branch that bears some, uh, the, the branch that bears much and, uh, or, or more and then the branch that bears much fruit, where do you fall? Where are you on that scale? And the other question is, where do you want to be? You need to know that if you feel stuck in a rut spiritually and, and just being involved in the things of the Lord, if you feel like you really haven't been making much of a, of a difference for God, it doesn't have to be that way. He who began a good work in you, Paul says, he wants nothing more than to carry it on to completion in the day of Jesus Christ. Next Sunday, we're going to be talking about the provision of the vine, what Christ gives to us how he feeds us to help us grow and to be fruitful. The scripture says, ask and you shall receive. We pray that Christ does this in our lives and in doing that we, we open our hearts to him. Jesus is waiting for your permission to help you become more fruitful. But for today, I want you to decide if you want to be a fruitful vine for the Lord um, or if you want to even be more than that, you want the basket to be full. You want to be very fruitful for him. Now, if you don't, if, if none of this really strikes you at all, you don't care about what Christ has said here and about what I have said this morning, I don't know that there's a lot that I can do for you except to urge you to look through the passage again and see what happens to the branches that bear no fruit. But if this does speak to you, if you want to be better for Christ, choose one area where, you're, where you will make a conscious effort uh, to make a lasting difference this week. Maybe you'll reach out with God's love to, to someone new. Maybe you'll reach out uh, and, and actually speak about spiritual matters with somebody, and you've been really hesitant about doing that. Maybe you'll show your family the, the love and the care that perhaps you've been neglecting. But let the Holy Spirit help you pick your commitment for this week, and then go forth and be fruitful. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we tend to get very self-absorbed sometimes. And when this happens in our own selfishness and pride, it's easy to, to then forget about the world around us. We forget that we've been called to make a difference. And so, Lord, we ask for your forgiveness. For any day that we have not helped someone, any day that we have not encouraged someone or witnessed to someone, 
any day that we've not shown the world that you are our Savior, we ask that you would forgive us and help us to do better because we want to be fruitful for you. We want to be part of the kingdom growth by using the opportunities and the gifts that you give to us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing together our hymn of response, which is, Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. This is a hymn of commitment of ourselves to God. And so as we're singing this, if you have a decision that you want to share, or if you want to come forward just for a time of, of prayer, you can certainly do that. But also let this be a time of preparation for the Lord's Supper that we're going to receive in just a few moments. Let's stand together. seated. If you came in this morning and you did not receive the, uh, the little Lord's Supper cup with the, the cracker or the wafer and, and you want one, kind of wave your hand and, and Lori's looking and she'll, she'll bring it to you if you did not get it on your way in. I toyed with the idea, kind of knowing what my topic would be today, talking about the grapes and all that, of giving you each a grape. I thought, you know, rather than the grape juice, maybe just everybody will have a grape this, this morning. Uh, that wasn't going to work out so well. But I think it's appropriate for us to think about what Jesus was doing when he gave his uh, disciples what we, we call the Lord's Supper, uh, part, of, uh, part of that Passover meal as they were together. Two very common things, the bread, the bread symbolizing just what you need of nourishment for life, and, and then the, uh, um, the, the juice, and of course the, uh, the wine or the grape juice was very common in, in, their, in their culture, and Jesus said, this bread is my body, meaning I'm what you need for, for true life, for eternal life, for abundant life. You need to know me. You need to be uh, united with me. And then when he talked about the, uh, the juice, he said, you know, this fruit of the vine, this is the new covenant in my blood. My blood is going to be shed on the cross, and, and it is, it is going to be shed so that your sins can be forgiven, forgiven, that you would know the true depth of God's love, that the price would be paid, and yet you can be counted as, as uh, innocent, as, as able to be in God's presence. And so these two things Jesus gave to them, and it was powerful. They understood what he was saying. 
And now 2,000 years later, we understand as well. And so in this moment, we're going to pause and we're going to have a prayer over these two elements, the bread and the cup. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your son Jesus into the world to show us the depth of your love for us and also to show us what it means to live a, a life of faith and of righteousness. But more than that, through Christ, we have the power um, to do what is right, the power we don't have on our own. And through Christ, we are given the gift of eternal life where we can be in your presence forever and ever. And so I thank you for the body, that, his body that he gave to die on the cross, for his blood that was shed. And as we receive the Lord's Supper today, we remember the gift with gratitude. In Jesus' name, amen. So you can pull the, the first little cellophane tab, if you haven't already done that. I say you can. <laughs> I'm sure I can too. Here we go. And Jesus said, this is my body given for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. Then Jesus took the cup there from the Passover table and he gave it to his disciples. He told them each to drink from it. And he said, this is the covenant, the new covenant in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this, do it in remembrance of me. And the Apostle Paul says, whenever we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we remember the Lord's death until he comes again. Would you stand with me as we sing together, Blessed Be the Time. 